Hi, I'm Jeff Groh and this is Calculus 2. Today we're going to talk about Taylor series. Earlier in this module, we talked about Taylor polynomials. Taylor polynomials only applied if a function had enough derivatives. If you had some function f, the nth degree Taylor polynomial was the sum as k goes from 0 to n, the kth order derivative evaluated at some center x0, x minus x0 to the power k divided by k factorial. These were pretty good approximations to many of the functions that you know and love. So good that we had the Taylor remainder theorem. The remainder was the error in approximating the function by this polynomial. If the function had n plus 1 derivatives, then we had a formula for the Taylor remainder. In particular, the Taylor remainder involved the n plus first derivative evaluated at some point z lying between x and x naught, x minus x naught to the power n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. The theorem did not tell exactly where z is, it only guaranteed the existence of such a z. What we're going to do today is look at what happens given some function f that is infinitely differentiable. We're going to look at the function, the sum, as k goes from 0 to infinity, kth derivative at x naught divided by k factorial, x minus x naught to the power k. This is clearly the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth order Taylor polynomial. Does this converge to the original function f of x? This is the key question. Is this equal to f of x? The answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. I'm going to make a definition first. If f is infinitely differentiable at some point, it's Taylor series is the sum as k goes from 0 to infinity, the kth order derivative at x0, x minus x0 to the power k, divided by k factorial. If x0 is 0, we call the series a Maclaurin series. Note that we have not assumed that this function is equal to the original function f. In fact, that's not always the case, but it is for all nicely behaved functions, functions that are called analytic. The theorem goes like this. If f is infinitely differentiable on an open interval i, 
containing x naught. Then f of x is the Taylor series. If and only if the limit as n goes to infinity of that nth order remainder is zero everywhere inside of the open interval i. The proof requires that we go both ways. Let's begin by going in the reverse direction. We'll suppose that the limit as n goes to infinity of those remainders is zero everywhere within the interval. By Taylor's theorem, we know that f of x is the Taylor polynomial plus the remainder. All we have to do is take the limit of both sides. The limit of the Taylor polynomials is the Taylor series. And the limit of the remainders is, by hypothesis, zero. And so the function is the same as the Taylor series. Going in the other direction, we'll suppose f of x is the sum as k goes from 0 to infinity of the kth order derivative at x0 divided by k factorial x minus x0 to the power k, which is, by the way, the limit of the partial sums, the partial sums being Taylor polynomials. Again, by Taylor's theorem, the remainder is the function minus the Taylor polynomial. If we now take the limit as n goes to infinity, we get the function minus the limit but wait a minute, we're assuming that this function is the limit of these Taylor polynomials, so the limit on the right is zero, hence the remainders go to zero. And that's the end of the proof. Now, there are a lot of nice functions that do, in fact, equal their Taylor series. Let me give you an example. Find the Maclaren series for the sine function. show f of x equals the series on the entire real line. Let me show you functionally how to calculate the Taylor series, or in this case, the McLaren series. We're going to start off by making two columns. First, the function and its derivatives. Notice that at the fourth derivative for sine, we're back to sine, which means this will repeat from here. We'll evaluate at zero. Notice that sine of zero is zero, cosine of zero is one. From 
from here, we repeat the same values, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, and so on. Keep in mind that the series Since x naught is equal to 0, we'll have this is our series. This is equal to f of 0, f prime of 0 divided by 1 factorial, which is 1, x to the 1, f double prime at 0 divided by 2 factorial, x squared, and so on. In this case, we had f of 0 was 0. In fact, every other f prime at 0 was 1, so we end up with just x. On the next, next term, we have that third order derivative at 0 divided by 3 factorial, x cubed. That's going to be minus 1 over 3 factorial, x cubed. The next non-zero term, again, all of these, we had 1, negative 1. 1, negative 1. We're going to have 1 over 5 factorial x to the 5th minus 1 over 7 factorial x to the 7th and so on. It turns out the Maclaren series for the sine function is it's alternating plus, minus, plus, minus. It has only odd powers and odd factorials. To get it to alternate, we're going to have negative 1 to the power k. If we start at k equals 0, we'll start out with a positive. We want the powers on x to all be odd. To accomplish that, we'll write 2k plus 1. You can see that when k is equal to 0, we have x to the 1. When k is equal to 1, we'll have x cubed, and so on down the line. To make the same factorials in the denominator, we'll have to divide by 2k plus 1 factorial. This is the Maclaren series for the sine function. The question that we have is, does that equal the sine function? It has certain properties that would work. If you evaluate it 0, x equals 0, you do get 0. Also, it is odd. It has only odd powers of x, and sine is an odd function. But to prove equality with the sine function, we have to analyze the Taylor remainder and show that the Taylor remainder goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. The Taylor remainder was the n plus first derivative evaluated at some point z divided by n plus 1 factorial x minus x naught to the power n plus 1. In this case, x naught was 0, since we're dealing with a Maclaren series. So z is between x and 0. Either way, all of the derivatives of the sine function are either plus or minus sine or plus or minus cosine. Because sine and cosine are both bounded by 1. Let's take the maximum over all z between 0 and x of that n plus first derivative times the absolute value of x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial. These derivatives are either plus or minus sine and plus or minus cosine but that's no bigger than 1. So we'll have that times x to the value n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial. We have the nth order remainder is bounded by this quantity here. If we now take the limit as n goes to infinity of the Taylor remainders, Whatever it is, it's bigger than or equal to 0, but less than or equal to the limit as n goes to infinity 
of the absolute value x to the power n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial. In the numerator, we have an exponential growth on n, but in the denominator, we have factorial growth. Which one wins? The answer is factorial growth is faster than exponential growth. And so the remainders will tend to zero. We deduce then that sine of x is equal to x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus x to the seventh over 7 factorial and so on forever. It is the sum. As k goes from 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the power k, x to the 2k plus 1 divided by 2k plus 1 factorial. This is true as long as x is measured in radians. And what is more, this is true for all x on the entire real line. This series will converge. The radius of convergence will be equal to infinity. And we get equality with the sine function on the entire real line. We've just calculated the Maclaurin series for sine of x. Let's do cosine of x next, because it's quite similar. This is the function, the zeroth order derivative. Its derivative is sine negative sine of x. The second order derivative is negative cosine of x. Third order derivative is positive sine of x and then cosine of x after that, it will repeat. We evaluate at 0, we're going to have 1, 0, negative 1, 0, and these will repeat. I want to sear into your brains that the Maclaurin series is the sum as k goes from 0 to infinity the kth order derivative at 0 divided by k factorial x to the power k, which is f of 0, f prime of 0 x, f double prime at 0 x squared over 2 factorial, the third order derivative at 0 over 3 factorial x cubed, and so on. In this particular case, f of 0 is 1, 0, minus 1, 0, and so we have 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial minus so on. In sigma notation, we can write this as the sum as k goes from 0 to infinity. And again, it must alternate plus, minus, plus, minus, and so forth. We have only even powers, and keep in mind the cosine function is even. So there is no coincidence in having only even powers. We describe those even powers by 2k, and we divide by those even factorials. There are certain functions that you must memorize the Maclaurin series representation of. And in particular, sine x is x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus so on. We can express that in sigma notation as the sum as k goes from 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the k, x to the 2k plus 1 divided by 2k plus 1 factorial. Also, cosine x is 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial minus so on. And in sigma notation, that's the sum as k goes from 0 to infinity, negative 1 to the k, x to the 2k divided by 2k factorial. You need to know this 
both expressed term by term like this and also in sigma notation for both sine and cosine and for e to the x, which is coming up. You also need to know that both of these give equality and converge on the entire real line. The radius of convergence for each of these series is plus infinity. You should also recognize that each of these series is a power series. Analytic functions can be represented by power series. That means both sine and cosine are analytic. As our next example, we'll suppose f of x is e to the x, which we know all of the derivatives of to begin with. And so we know the value of all these derivatives evaluated at zero as well. So the McLaren series then is going to be one function value is 1 and all of its derivatives are 1. All of these coefficients for the powers of x are 1 divided by the appropriate factorial and so on. It turns out it's possible to prove that the remainder goes to 0 for any x and hence we get equality with the function e to the x. In sigma notation, this is the sum as k goes from 0 to infinity, x to the power k divided by k factorial. You need to know this. Just with this limited knowledge of these three functions McLaren series, we can do some interesting things. We're going to prove Euler's formula. Turns out e to the i x is cosine x plus i times the sine of x. We can prove this formula now. Do you remember this notation back in pre-calculus? cosine x plus i sine x has a notation. It's called cis x. This is by definition. Cis is defined to be this expression. We're going to prove that cis x is e to the i times x. Using the Maclaren series, e to the i x is equal to 1 plus i x plus ix squared over 2 factorial, plus ix cubed over 3 factorial, and so on. That's 1 plus i times x. i squared is negative 1. So we have negative x squared over 2 factorial. And i cubed is negative i x cubed over 3 factorial i to the fourth is 1. Rearranging terms, every other term is real, and every other term is pure imaginary. Collecting the real terms, we have 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial, plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial, and so on. And factoring the i, out of the pure imaginary terms, we'll have x minus x cubed over 3 factorial and so on. You should be able to recognize both of these parts. This part is clearly cosine x plus i, and this part, all the odd terms alternating in sine, is sine x. Now that you know Euler's formula, I want you to consider e to the i times pi. According to our formula, that's the cosine of pi plus i times the sine of pi. Now, sine of pi is zero because the sine of every integer multiple of pi is zero. 
the cosine of pi is negative 1. We see then that e to the i pi is negative 1. This connects four of the most important numbers in mathematics, the discovery of each of which was an important milestone. The discovery of negative numbers, the discovery of pi, the discovery of the imaginary unit i, and Euler's number e. There is an important fact about power series that you need to know. If we have one power series, and that power series equals another power series, This can only happen if all of the corresponding coefficients are equal. This gives us an easy way to calculate certain Taylor series without having to do all of the derivatives. For example, we know that 1 over 1 minus x is 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed and so on because here we have a geometric series with common ratio x. And the sum of that will be the first term, 1, divided by 1 minus the common ratio. This converges for absolute value of x less than 1. Now, <clears throat> since this function is equal to this power series, then we may deduce that this is the Maclaren series as well, without having to do all of the derivatives of this function evaluated at x equals 0. Additionally, 1 over 1 plus x squared is like evaluating the previous Maclaren series by replacing x with negative x squared. If we integrate a series, we can obtain the Maclaren series for the antiderivative, and in particular, the integral of arc tan, the, the integral of one over one plus x squared is arc tan of x. You can see now that you'll have x minus x cubed over three plus x to the fifth over five minus x to the seventh over seven, and so on. This gives us the Maclaren series for inverse tangent, keeping in mind that one over one minus x is one plus x plus x squared and so on. If we integrate log absolute value of one minus x plus a constant is equal to x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3, and so on. What is the value of c? We can find that out by evaluating at x equals 0, because the natural log of 1 is 0. And when we evaluate the right-hand side at 0, all the terms are 0. So this constant is, in fact, 0. And we deduce, then, that the log of the absolute value of 1 minus x or x minus 1. When you reverse the order of uh, subtraction, normally you get a minus sign. But that minus sign is inside of an absolute value, so we can ignore it. We have to be a little careful. The original series converges between negative 1 and 1. This one does too. When you integrate a series, you have the same radius of convergence. So if the radius of convergence originally is 1, so will this one have a radius of convergence of 1 as well, which you can easily calculate in its own right. Looking at 1 over x, 
we can think of that as 1 over 1 minus negative x minus 1, which is 1 minus x minus 1 plus x minus 1 squared minus x minus 1 cubed and so on. It follows then that the log of the absolute value of x plus c will be x minus 1 minus x minus 1 squared over 2 plus x minus 1 cubed over 3 and so on. Notice I've strategically inserted a minus 1 here to make this term like the others. Does that appropriately account for the constant c? To evaluate, we'll plug in x equals 1. And note that the natural log of 1 is 0. All of these terms will be 0. We deduce then that c, the constant of integration, is 0. And so we have an exact representation for the natural log of x. We'll have x minus 1 minus x minus 1 squared over 2 plus x minus 1 cubed over 3 and so on. Though we have to be careful, the radius of convergence here is the same as the radius of convergence above, and that is still 1. But this time, we're centered at 1. And so our interval of convergence will contain everything from 0 to 2. If you test for convergence at x equals 2, 2 minus 1 is 1, you end up with the alternating harmonic series. That tells us that we get convergence at the right-hand endpoint, and the interval of convergence is equal to the half-open, half-closed interval from 0 to 2, not including 0, but including 2. I want to take a look at this particular series, and in particular, I want to graph what the various Taylor polynomial approximations look like, because you kind of need to know what's going on at 0 and what's going on at 2. The natural log function has an essential singularity at x equals 0. The function goes to minus infinity as you go to 0 from the left or the right. What happens to the Taylor polynomial approximations? I want to look at what happens when we plot various polynomial approximations. Let's start simply I'm going to define our polynomial our Taylor polynomials for the natural log function. As we've seen, that's going to be a sum of x minus 1 to the power k. Um, these alternate in signs, so I need to multiply by negative 1 to the, to the power of k plus 1, since we have to start out positive. And we need to divide by k. k goes from 1 to n, and we need to plot this thing Oops. and I want to plot that against the uh, natural log function. We're going to plot this from 0 to, let's say, scaling constrained. I'm going to limit the view though to go from um, minus, well, how about zero to three, minus three to three. You can see then what's going on here. In green, we have the 
natural log function which has a singularity at the origin at x equals zero. We're using a polynomial of degree three to approximate, which is very good at x equals one. It gets worse and worse the further away you go. What happens in the limit as these ends get bigger? Let's make n equals to four, an even, oops, 34, ha, ah, four. And let's change the colors of these. Red and black. Red now is my natural log function, and in black we have this fourth degree polynomial. Notice that it peels away very badly as we get much bigger than two. Remember, we had an interval of convergence from zero to two not including zero because natural log is not even defined at zero, but including two. What happens if we use a 10 degree McLaren polynomial? You can see that the approximation is getting quite a bit better until we get to two where these things diverge very badly. How about a 20 degree Taylor polynomial? Wow, you can see that the approximation is really getting very good until just a little bit bigger than two, and it's even fairly good close to uh, the origin, except for the fact that polynomials will be finite at the origin, whereas the log function goes to minus infinity. Now these have been even. What if I do a 21 degree polynomial? You can see it diverges in the other direction but it's still pretty good until you get to about two. Polynomial of degree 100. You can kind of see what's going on. The approximation is going to be very good between zero and two, and then after that, it breaks loose and it's just terrible. You can see why we are getting convergence at two, of course you can't get convergence at zero because the natural log is not even defined there. We could take the limit as we go to infinity here. Which in Maple, the program we're using, is denoted by the word infinity. You can see now that these two are right on top of each other, at least as far as they exist. It doesn't give you a sense of where this fails to, the, where the Taylor series now fails to exist. The Taylor series will give you nothing beyond x equals two. It's only defined between zero and two, not including zero, but including two. That's why we needed to look at what happens with the Taylor polynomials of various degrees. Okay, so we have a representation for natural log that is defined on the interval from zero to two. Is it possible to get a representation for log that's defined at three? The answer is sure. All you have to do is center your Taylor series representation at a point where the function is analytic. The natural log is analytic everywhere except for the singularity at zero. So let's define f of x to be the natural log of x. Let's calculate the derivatives. f prime is one over x, f double prime is negative one over x squared, we'll call that negative x to the minus two. The Third order derivative is going to be positive two factorial x to the minus three. The fourth derivative is going to be negative three factorial x to the minus four. And I think you can see what's going on here. Let's evaluate these at say two. prime at two is one half, f double prime at two is negative one over two squared, f 
triple prime of 2 is positive 2 factorial over 2 cubed. The fourth derivative of 2 is negative 3 factorial over 2 to the power 4, and so on. Let's see if we can construct the Taylor series centered at 2. So in calculating the Taylor series, you can see that we have ln of x is ln of 2 plus 1 half over 1 factorial x minus 2 minus 1 over 2 squared over 2 factorial x minus 2 squared plus 2 factorial over 2 cubed over 3 factorial x minus 2 cubed. Yes, you can see that we have a 2 factorial and a 3 factorial. And the next term will be minus 3 factorial over 2 to the 4th, 4 factorial x minus 2 to the power 4th, and so on. The 3 factorial will cancel the factorial down here. How does this all simplify? I think you can see that we get the log of the absolute value of x is the natural log of 2. Now, this first term can be expressed as x minus 2 over 2. We alternate in signs after this. The next term has a 1 half and then x minus 2 over 2 squared. The following term is 1 third x minus 2 over 2 cubed. And so we have plus 1 third x minus 2 over 2 cubed. The next term, minus 1 fourth x minus 2 over 2 to the power 4, and so on. It's easy to check that the radius of convergence for this particular series is 2, and the interval of convergence is from 0 to 4, including 4, of course, not including 0. So, if you want to calculate a power series representation for natural log, if you center it at some point C, the interval of convergence will go from 0 to twice C. You won't be able to extend that interval of convergence for that particular representation because of the singularity at 0. And this, there's a certain symmetry about these intervals of convergence going from the center, radius this way, radius that way, no further. I want to recall to your memory the binomial theorem. That says that x plus y to the power n is the sum as k goes from 0 to n of n choose k, x to the n minus k, y to the power k, where these Binomial coefficients n choose k come from the rows of the of Pascal's triangle or the formula n factorial over k factorial n minus k factorial. Do you remember this theorem and how we used Pascal's triangle? Let's suppose we want to calculate x plus y to the fourth. Pascal's triangle is like this. You add the two above to get the one below. Every new row begins with one and ends with one, and then you sum the two above to get the element in the next row. Since we're raising this to the power four, we're going to use the four row. This is the zero row, one row, two row, three row. We start off with x to the power 4, and then we take the binomial coefficient 4. We reduce the power on x by 1 and increase the power on y by 1. So 
So x plus y to the fourth is this expression. Is there a similar exp expression for x plus y to the power r, where instead of r being a whole number, could uh, we choose r to be some other real number? The answer obviously has to be yes, or else I wouldn't have brought this up. Remember how n choose k is n factorial over k factorial n minus k factorial? n minus k factorial is n minus k, n minus k minus 1. You can see that most of this is going to cancel. And we'll just have n times n minus 1 down to n minus k plus 1 over k factorial. We're going to make the following definition. Let p be an element of the set of real numbers and k an element of the set of whole numbers. p choose k is going to be p times p minus 1 down to p minus k plus 1 divided by k factorial, an exact analogy to the usual binomial coefficients. The only difference being we're not constraining ourselves to letting this upper entry be a natural or whole number. What we're going to do next is find the Maclaurin series for the function f of x equals x plus 1 to the power p. So remember that a Maclaurin series is a Taylor series centered at zero. The first step is to write our function and its derivatives. And then if we're finding a Maclaurin series, we evaluate these at zero. We see then that the Maclaurin series for x plus 1 to the power p, and it is possible to show that you do in fact get equality, is 1 plus p times x plus p times p minus 1 over 2 factorial x squared, and so on. We obtain what is called the binomial series. works provided that p is an element of r, but not 0, of course. x plus 1 to the power p is the sum, as k goes from 0 to infinity, of p choose k, x to the power k. We can see, then, that the square root of x plus 1 will be 1. Remember that the next term has a coefficient of p. In this case, p is 1 half. The very next term has 1 half times 1 half minus 1 over 2 factorial x squared. 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. The following term will be 1 half times 1 half minus 1 times 1 half minus 2 divided by 3 factorial x cubed, and so on. By the way, it's using the binomial series that Newton first tried to prove, the power rule for derivatives.
Obviously, he was working on a whole other level than the rest of us. If I want to calculate the square root of 1.1, all I have to do is replace x equals 0 0.1 in the series above. Here we have a minus 1 eighth 0 0.1 squared. On the next term, we have two negatives, making it positive. We'll have 1 half. We had a negative 1 half, but the negative canceled. And a negative 3 halves. This is all over 3 factorial. This 3 cancels here. And you can see that we'll have a 1 16th as our coefficient for this last term. So we'll have 1 plus 0 0.05 minus 1 eighth times a tenth squared plus 1 16th times 0 0.1 cubed. My calculator is giving me something on the order of 1.048125. And if I calculate the square root of 1.1, it gives me 1.048808. So we are correct to four decimal place accuracy using the binomial series to estimate the square root of 1.1. There are a few more examples that I would like to look at. Suppose I have sinh of x, which I know to be e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2, and cosh of x, which is e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2. These are definitions, which means you're just going to accept them. In other words, this is a way of calculating the even part of e to the x, and this is a way of calculating the odd part of e to the x. If you follow this through, you can see that the hyperbolic cosine is e to the x, plus what you get when you replace x by negative x. All over 2. What cancels out are all of the odd parts. And you end up with 1 plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial and so on. Notice that this is very similar to the power series for sine of x. The only difference is that sine of x alternates in sine, plus, minus, plus, minus, and so on, whereas the Maclaren series for hyperbolic cosine of x does not alternate, but it does only have the even terms. In a similar way, it's easy to show that the Maclaren series for hyperbolic sine has only the odd powers of e to the x. And again, it does not alternate in sine as the series for the regular sine function does. So check this out. Suppose I calculate the hyperbolic sine of i times x. This would be i times x plus i times x cubed over 3 factorial, and so on. So what is i cubed? i cubed is negative i. And i to the fifth multiplies another i squared on. i squared is minus 1. So we get plus i. If we factor i out, we get x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial and so on. 
And I require that you recognize that this is the sine function. So check it out. The hyperbolic sine evaluated at i times x is i times the regular sine of x. There is a relationship between hyperbolic sine and sine, but it requires using complex numbers. We can play that game again with hyperbolic cosine. What happens if we evaluate the hyperbolic cosine at i times x? I squared is negative 1. I to the fourth is positive 1. You can see that we get exactly the cosine of x this time. I want to take another look at the limit as x goes to 0 of sine x divided by x in light of Maclaren series. We know that sine is x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial and so on. And if we're dividing by x, we can cancel 1x on each of the terms above. We'll have 1 minus x squared over 3 factorial plus x to the fourth over 5 factorial and so on. Since x is going to 0, all the terms except for the first disappear and the limit is 1, something that we've known since calculus 1. Since physicists like to calculate limits using Maclaren series, let's try another one. Let's do the limit as x goes to 0 of cosine of x minus 1 plus x squared over 2 divided by x to the fourth power. Knowing the Maclaren series for cosine, that's 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial, etc. minus 1 plus x squared over 2 divided by x to the fourth. You can see the 1 will cancel, the x squared over 2's cancel, and then we can cancel an x to the fourth. All the remaining terms will have powers higher than four, and so as x goes to zero, their limits will be zero. But since the x to the fourth cancels on that first remaining term, the answer is 1 24th. There's one more loose end that I'd like to tie up, and that is I want to show that the set of analytic functions is a proper subset of the set of infinitely differentiable functions. The way that we're going to do that is we're going to exhibit a function that is infinitely differentiable, but not analytic at the origin. That function is, by definition, e to the minus 1 over x squared when x is not 0, and 0 when x equals 0. We're going to show that this function is infinitely differentiable at the origin, and in particular, all of the derivatives at the origin are 0. Note that if all of the derivatives at the origin are 0, then the Maclaren series has coefficients all equal to 0, which means you get the 0 function for the Maclaren series. This function is not equal to a zero everywhere. In fact, it only equals zero when x equals zero. The exponential function isn't zero anywhere else. This function will be very, very smooth, very, very smooth, infinitely smooth, and very close to zero down here. In fact, it dwells close to zero for a long time. That's different from the Maclaren series, which will be identically zero. So this function will not equal its Maclaren series on any interval containing the origin. Since this function does not equal its Maclaren series in any neighborhood of the origin, it won't equal any power series in any neighborhood of the origin, which means this function is not representable by a power series centered at the origin, so it's not analytic at the origin. 
What's left to show is to prove that all of the derivatives at zero are zero. By definition, f of zero is zero. Let's look at f prime at zero. This should be the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus zero plus h minus f of zero over h. Well, we already know f of zero is zero. What is f of h when h is not zero? We have the limit as h goes to zero. We have this one over h. f of h is going to be negative one over h squared. What happens in the limit as h goes to zero? You can see that if we set u equal to one over h, as h goes to zero, u is going to go to plus or minus infinity. Let's take the limit as u goes to infinity of u times e to the minus u squared. You can see we'll get the same limit going to plus or minus infinity because e to the minus u squared will go to zero at an exponential rate, whereas u only climbs at a linear rate. So the derivative at zero is zero. We can use a similar method to prove that all of the other derivatives are zero. Since the derivative at the origin of all orders, since all the derivatives at the origin of all orders are equal to zero, this function is differentiable at x equals zero. In fact, it's infinitely differentiable at x equals zero, but it doesn't equal its Maclaren series and hence it's not analytic. We can see that differentiability is a level of smoothness. Infinite differentiability is a level of smoothness that is very high. Very, very smooth functions are infinitely differentiable. Analytic functions are even more smooth in a certain sense. Most of the functions that you've dealt with up till now have been analytic. There are exceptions, things like the absolute value of x, x to the power of negative, uh, x to the power of two thirds, and so on. Don't think you've seen the last of this. You'll see a lot of these examples extended in courses higher up in the curriculum. For example, how do you calculate e to the power of a matrix if m is a square matrix? Turns out i plus m plus 1 over 2 factorial m squared plus 1 over 3 factorial m cubed, and so on. We use the Maclaren series, but we substitute the matrix in for the variable. And instead of the number one, we use the thing that acts like the number one for matrices, the identity matrix.